on a cold evening in Lancashire on the 3rd of January 1872, around 500 Victorian revellers and merrymakers piled into the Manders Grand Star National Menagerie for a night of frills. The poster promised an audience with birds and beasts, including monsters of the deep and elephants from the east. But the main reason this 19th century crowd flocked to the Bolton marketplace on that foggy evening was to see Maserati, the lion tamer, carry out insane and amazing feats with his troop of big cats. What they didn't expect to see was a truly gruesome spectacle that would later be described as one of the most harrowing and shocking deaths ever witnessed. Before we dive in, I want to let you know that this happened a very long time ago, so I've done my best to give you a visual reference. Also, please don't forget to drop the video a like and subscribe if you are new. It really helps me out. Thank you. Born Thomas McCart in Cork, Ireland, in around 1839. Maserati the Lion Tamer had worked in menageries his entire adult life and probably as a child as well, linked to a well-known family of circus performers who travelled the world performing on the trapeze and high wire. The life of a travelling entertainer was likely all he ever knew. By the time he joined the Manders Menagerie, he was earning £4 a week the modern day equivalent of about 480 pounds. Traveling menageries have a long history with origins dating back thousands of years. However, they became particularly popular during the Middle Ages in Europe. In the medieval period, rulers and wealthy individuals often kept private collections of exotic animals, which were sometimes displayed to the public on special occasions. These collections laid the groundwork for the development of traveling menageries as a form of entertainment. Their popularity continued to grow throughout the 19th century, fueled by advancements in transportation and a growing fascination with the natural world. Menageries became a common feature at fairs, exhibitions and other public events, attracting audiences eager to see exotic creatures from distant lands. Menageries served as an educational function as well. In an era before widespread access to books or other forms of media, these travelling exhibitions offered a valuable opportunity for people to learn about the natural world. Yet amid the wonder and excitement of the menagerie experience, there were of course darker aspects to this exciting pastime. Many creatures were confined to cramped and inadequate enclosures, leading to stress, illness and premature death. Some menageries would have engaged in unethical practices like capturing animals from the wild in unsustainable ways and at times the animals of the menagerie would be mistreated for the sake of entertainment. But still, the allure of the Victorian menagerie was undeniable. For those who attended, the experience was a sensory overload filled with the sights, sounds and smells of exotic creatures from around the globe. Living in a travelling menagerie during the Victorian era would have been a challenging and unique experience. Thomas would have woken up each day to the sounds of wagons creaking and animals stirring as the caravan prepared to move to its next destination. For Thomas and his colleagues, life was a perpetual journey in towns and cities, serving as temporary stops along the way. Long hours, harsh weather conditions, and the physical demands of caring for exotic animals would take its toll on individuals living and working in the menagerie. Amidst the hardship, there was a strong sense of community among the inhabitants of the Manders Menagerie, which had been established since 1850 and found success 
touring both the UK and America, as well as having strong friendships within the menagerie. Thomas also lived and travelled with his wife, though they had no children. They had joined the Manders a year earlier, having replaced the world-famous Martini Macomo, one of the first black lion tamers in Britain, and arguably the most famous lion tamer in Victorian England at the time. He had died of natural causes in Sunderland, and had left a noticeable gap in the Manders roster. Expectations were therefore high for Thomas. Part of the reason why he was such a draw for the menagerie was because of a macabre and gruesome injury he had obtained 10 years earlier on the job. When, according to newspapers at the time, his left arm had been torn off by a lion whilst working in a circus. It happened in mid-November of 1862 when he was working as a lion keeper in Liverpool. As the then 22-year-old walked past a lion cage, one of the lionesses, for some unknown reason, grabbed his arm and brutally lacerated it. Although his cries summoned help from a performer named Batty, Maserati's arm was so severely damaged, there was no choice but to amputate. It was normal at the time for menageries, carnivals and circuses to intentionally hire individuals who could provide a shock factor due to things like disabilities, race or gender. And Thomas's previous brush with disaster made his act seem even more dangerous and added to his tough lion tamer persona. In reality, this incident had left him with an unconquerable fear for the animals that he had to work with every single day and he often drank before shows in order to calm his nerves. To further add to his anxieties, Thomas already had a few altercations with the lions at Manders. A local paper reported that the first time whilst performing at Edinburgh, when one of the lions made a snap at his right arm, but only slightly grazed it. The next occasion was only two days before the incident on the third when one of the black mane animals, known as the Asiatic Lion, bit him slightly on the wrist and finger. Thomas confided in his wife that he was scared of the black maned lion and would dread every night he would have to spend with the beast, which was around nine foot long and weighed nearly 30 stone. Despite these near misses and his fear of the lions, Thomas continued to drink before shows regularly and turned his back on the wild animals. A bad habit he was repeatedly warned against by his friends and colleagues. Just past 10 p.m. on that fateful Wednesday night, Maserati the Lion Tamer prepared for his last show of the evening. It was an extra slot to please the baying crowds in the venue where they had been performing for five nights. It was supposed to be the menagerie's last night in the area before packing up and moving on. His wife hadn't seen him since 2 p.m. when he kissed her goodbye and told her he'd be home for dinner. Though he was sober when he left, by 10.30, Thomas had partaken in the Dutch courage, which would allow him to enter the ring with five fully grown lions, but may have ultimately led to his downfall. As he prepared for the last section of the show, which would see him go up against all five lions in an act called lion hunting, Thomas addressed the crowd directly, educating them about the lions and their grisly capability, skillfully whipping the crowd up into a delighted frenzy. Dressed in a gladiator garb and wielding a sword, the act required Thomas to drive the lions from one side of the cage to the other in a display of pure animalistic force that would have wowed the audience. But in a harrowing turn of events, Thomas was thrown to the ground, seemingly accidentally, by one of the lions. He regained his footing quickly and managed to drive the animals back into one corner. However, in the next instant, what should have been a thrilling and routine spectacle 
turned into a frantic struggle for survival. He walked into the center of the stage, stamped his feet in order to prompt the lions to run across the den again, but his momentary weakness seemed to pose an opportunity to an African lion, which stalked the corner of the den and launched a surprise attack with ferocious intensity, seizing him by the hip and throwing him to the ground. Initially mistaken as part of the performance, the horrified spectators soon realized the grave reality of the situation. As Thomas's agonized cries pierced the air, amidst the pandemonium, spectators scrambled for the makeshift weapons, while women shrieked in terror and men rushed to Thomas's aid. The lions, now wild and frenzied, pounced upon their helpless prey tearing flesh and bone with savage fury. A local paper reported that he was lying upon his side, his head partly raised, and his body resting upon the stump of his left arm, while with his right arm, he was making desperate lunges amongst the now wild and infuriated animals with his sword. The Asiatic lion ripped off the poor man's arm, tearing the flesh and fracturing the bones in one or two places, and the sword then dropped from his hand. The menagerie crew attempted to intervene, attacking the lions the best they could with forks, scrapers, and any weapons they could get their hands on. However, because the show was unexpected and the last show of the night, the heated irons they would usually have in the fire in case of emergency had not been prepared, leaving the crew horribly ill-equipped to deal with the violent onslaught from the lions. Thomas's desperate struggle continued, his body battered and broken, his pleas for help drowned out by the roar of the lions. With every passing moment, the threat of his life loomed larger, as the ferocious animals showed no signs of relenting. A slide was inserted between the bars of the cage and managed to drive two of the lions off. However, as one animal was successfully distracted, another would take its place, and efforts to subdue them all at once repeatedly proved futile. The conflict raged on, Thomas dragged mercilessly up and down the cage, his life hanging by a thread. By this point, the flesh of his thighs had been entirely stripped from his body. The floor of the den was swamped with blood, and the relentless attack was nearing the 15-minute point. Valiant attempts were made to save Thomas's life. The paper reported that a butcher thrust at the lions with a large knife forcing the blade deep into one of the lion's neck and causing it to yell in pain and turn its attention away to its own safety. Another, he tried to stab in the heart, but the blade just glanced off the shoulder bone, while the third received lacerations to the face. One man inserted a broom into the cage and another a ladder, but the black-maned lion with a single wrench tore the broom head off the handle and leapt over the ladder with it. After some difficulty, the revolver of Thomas was drawn out of the case and fired at the noses of the lions, but they only relinquished their hold for a moment. The conflict was renewed again and again, and several times Thomas was dragged up and down the cage, one lion grabbing him by the head and the others by the legs. In a last-ditch effort to save Thomas, when the irons had finally been heated, they were used to drive the four animals behind a partition. Yet the struggle was far from over, as the maneless lion continued its attack. Only through sheer determination and the use of the heated bars to the lion's face, seriously injuring it, did the lion finally release its grip, allowing Thomas to be rescued. But it was too late. Maserati, the lion tamer, still alive but severely wounded, was rushed to the infirmary but died 15 minutes later. The paper reports the scalp from the crown to the neck had been torn away. All the flesh had been torn off both thighs, from the hips 
nearly to the knees. The right arm was fractured in two places, as well as badly lacerated, and there were also serious injuries to the chest. The bones of his pelvis had also been bitten right through. Thomas's last words, as he was being taken away from the blood-soaked den, were, Harry, I'm done for. Following the attack, there was much conjecture as to why it occurred, whether it was the lion tamers or simply indicative of the fact that wild lions cannot be tamed. One commentator identified several reasons for the tragic event. First, that it was a late show and the lions were likely hungry and agitated. Secondly, that Thomas was drunk. Testimony suggested that Thomas had consumed a large amount of alcohol. Though he wasn't considered drunk, witnesses noticed his demeanor as mischievous or bold, which could have impacted his interactions with the lions. Lastly, there were observations that Maserati didn't handle the lions with his usual skill and care. Witnesses reported that he prolonged certain aspects of the performance, raising concerns that this was aggravating the lions. This deviation from his typical approach was noted by many. Any of these factors could have contributed to the tragic outcome though the overwhelming feeling was that the lions just could not be safely tamed without the inevitability of a violent and grisly outcome. The black-maned lion that Thomas feared the most survived the encounter but was badly wounded by efforts to ward it off. It became somewhat notorious in Victorian society and was from that point on referred to as the McCart Lion. After two years, the wounds of the attack still remained visible when it died naturally in January 1874. Renowned taxidermist Roland Ward preserved and mounted the lion, naming it a wounded lion, and the taxidermy piece was prominently displayed in the window of Ward & Co's in Piccadilly, London. Rosina Manders, the owner of the Mangeray, honoured Thomas by installing a three-foot-high marble monument for the Bolton Roman Catholic Cemetery. Thank you for watching. This is truly a terrifying way to go. Until next time, stay sane.